Uh, hello, my name is Gabriel Valdivia, and I'm currently a games intern here at SideFX. Um, today they asked me to talk a little bit about this Castle Defender VR project that me and a few other interns have been working on for the past couple months. Um, it's been me. Um, I've also had help from past intern Viviana Mora and two other current interns Joshua Aoki and Swam Goswami. Uh, the game was made completely in Unity and all the asset creation was done in Houdini. So uh, this whole talk is going to be pretty much about our whole Houdini art pipeline and how we got all those things out of Houdini and then built the game from there. Uh, but before I get into that, let me talk a little bit about the game itself. So the Castle Defender VR game is um, a game we made for the HTC Vive, and the whole game objective is pretty much as straightforward as the, the title of the game implies. The player is put into the center of a castle, and you have to defend that castle from endless waves of attacking enemies. So your whole goal is to just stay alive for as long as you can. And you do this through just phys uh, physically picking up and throwing out various objects onto the battlefield. Uh, two of these objects being uh, this knight and this ranger. These are two little AI units that you have, and once they hit the battlefield, um, their AI takes over and they go, you know, track pirates to attack and they just fight for you. And then you also have access to a bomb and a healing potion. Um, both upon impact either damage enemies or heal your own troops within a certain radius. And then all of your uh, objects in your arsenal take a certain amount of seconds to spawn. And as the game progresses, that takes longer and longer. So that's kind of where the difficulty starts to increase. But there is a simple gold system in place, so if you kill more and more pirates, you can accumulate a little bit of gold that you can then use to buy anything out in your arsenal immediately. So if you have you know, a wave coming at you from the right and all your units are busy already attacking that wave, and then you have a new one coming from your left, you can just spend some gold to purchase a few knights and a couple bombs and things to go um, take care of that new wave. And then to give you just a little bit more idea about the game, here's a, a little gameplay video of the most recent build. Okay, so what were some of our initial goals before we even set out to accomplish this project? Well, the big one being we wanted as much of the asset creation to uh, be done in Houdini as possible. Um, so all the characters from their uh, modeling, UVs, rigging, and animation was all done in Houdini. Um, we built um, various procedural assets that we used to build the level in Unity using Houdini Engine, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a couple minutes. And then we also um, did a couple uh, game effects that we built in Houdini, rendered those out as, as sprite sheets, and then built um, like that explosion and things like that in the game using those. Uh, we also knew we wanted it to be for the Vive, specifically, um, uh, yeah, specifically for the Vive. Um, this is because one thing that I've noticed, especially with people new to VR, is they love to put that headset on and just you know pick up a bunch of things and throw them uh, in any which uh, any which way. So we wanted our game to be simply focused around that whole mechanic of just having to uh, pick things up, throw them out, and you know having a bunch of things coming at you, but all you really have to worry about is that one simple mechanic. And then lastly, we were curious if we could implement any kind of runtime stuff. Um, for example, it would have been cool in the middle of the game, say you get some kind of defensive upgrade, and all you had to do was bend over and physically grab and pull up one of your castle walls or something like that. Um, but as you can see in this uh, tree example, uh, we have this little tree asset changing shape as we move our finger around on that touchpad. Um, and this is all happening um, in, in game, but this only ran at about three frames per second. So uh, we kind of quickly learned that we weren't able to incorporate any larger assets just due to the current state of the plugin. So that um, needs to be worked on a little bit more before we're able to do anything like that. And then just to talk a little bit about the art style. Uh, we knew before we even decided what kind of game we wanted to make. We wanted it to be very low poly, very cartoony, and we wanted the characters especially to be very, very cute. Um, in this first image from an artist named Abel Oros, this is what heavily inspired all the character designs. Uh, we really liked the whole blockiness of each one, 
but um, each character has this unique little element that distinguishes their silhouette uh, from each from um, each other. Like the guy there has his horns, and the other guy has like the the red hair. Um, in the second image, though, from an artist named Fabricio Marquez, this is what inspired the environment, having the player be put on an island with a boat circling the island. And then this last image is from the game Monument Valley, and this is not only um, not only do we pull inspiration from this for the low poly style, but we really liked the color palette, especially the bright pinks and the bright blues, and we thought that just looked really good inside the VR goggles. All right, so let's get into the whole meat of how we actually built all these assets. So all the environment assets were Houdini digital assets that we built in Houdini and then brought those into the game um, to build the level from there. But what exactly is a Houdini digital asset? Well, it's basically a way to capture the functionality of any node graph that you create in Houdini, whether that be a character rig, um, a procedural model, a particle system, um, a poly reduce tool. You, you can um, package up any of these node graphs into just a single node which becomes your Houdini digital asset. And now you have this custom reusable asset that you can use in you know, other projects or in your game engine. Uh, but the cool thing about building these assets is because Houdini has this non-destructive history, I can expose various parameters on any one of these assets or on any one of the nodes in, the, in that node graph. And that gets added to this custom user interface. As you can see here, um, I have this interface for my castle wall. These are various parameters that I expose when we built the wall to control like the wall height and the wall width. And you can see in this first um, image up here that uh, just by dragging a slider, the wall increases in height or the gate increases in width. And then the, the bars on the gate automatically update to um, accommodate those changes. So you can see how we can build these tweakable parameters that allows us to um, virtually have this live asset that we can manipulate instead of just building one single static mesh. And this other example shows how two Houdini digital assets can work together. So all I'm doing is dragging one slider that uh, pulls up the sloping of that terrain. And then the wall asset, being a completely separate HDA, reads those changes and reorients itself along uh, the terrain's normals. So it's pretty cool. So the assets we made for our game are uh, this island or this train asset. We built this wall tool. Uh, we built a little tree system. And then we also have ocean, mountains, and um, clouds. So the terrain was uh, pretty straightforward. All we really did was start by taking a uh, circle and we you know, subdivided it, triangulated it, and then we applied vertex colors to each point on that mesh. So all the points in the center of that um, circle, we assigned a value of one, and then it got progressively closer to zero as we reached the edges of that mesh. And then we used that vertex color to drive that sloping parameter. And then we also added um, some controls to increase like the thickness of the train, um, the erosion along the edges, um, some noise to kind of rough up the ground. And then after that, we built this little um, wall wall tool, which I'll talk a little bit more about in the next slide. But this one, you feed into it this um, island asset so it knows where to snap itself to, where to get its normals from. And then you give it this user input curve, and that's what dictates the shape that you want your castle to be or the, you know, the shape you want the walls to be. And then after that, we have this little tree system that pretty much just takes in this um, terrain and scatters a bunch of points um, randomly. But you have some controls over like the density of that scatter, um, you can control if you want the points to be scattered uniformly or if like you want them to be scattered in bunches and then it just randomly copies various trees to each one of those points and then you have a little bit further control over the randomization of that copy so you can control the randomization of their um, height, their width, the amount of bend you want in the trees. And then after that we have this ocean and mountain tool. Uh, they're both separate but they function in very similar ways. Um, they're pretty much just um, varying degrees of noise controls, obviously the mountain being more extreme because we want it to be much more jagged. And then lastly we have this um, cloud tool which I thought was one of the cooler tools to make because we pretty much just started by scattering a bunch of points and then we copied varying spheres and ovals to each one of those points to kind of build up that whole bubbly cloud shape. But because now we're left with this whole mess of overlapping geometry, we need to find a way to uh, get rid of all that intersecting geo. So in the tool, we're able to convert that to voxels, and when we convert that back to polygons, that pretty much cuts out all that um, intersecting geometry, and we're left with just that overall cloud shape. And then we can run this through a poly reduce node to get the poly count back down and kind of give us that cool little low poly look. So the clouds are one of the cool, um, cooler ones to make, in my opinion. And now I'm going to quickly walk you through um, how we built part of this wall asset. This is just to kind of show. Um, what it might look like building one of these assets in Houdini um, and what some of these node graphs might look like, some of the t uh, techniques we used. 
So this asset starts by, uh, we give it this user input terrain, which in our case is this island HDA, and then we give it this user input curve, which in Unity you would draw it yourself. And then we move that curve up to the top of the terrain. Uh, let's resample it so we have some more points to work with. And then we want to res um, ray those points to the terrain so the wall sits nicely on top. From there, we're going to take that raid line, and then we're going to take this um, little wall profile shape here, and we're going to copy that to each point on that terrain. So now when we sweep between all of those little profiles, we have uh, the shape of our walls. And then from there, I, I want to delete those bottom faces, so I can use a little bit of code to locate those bottom faces and delete them. And then I'm going to procedurally UV the asset. So if the walls were uh, different shapes or whatever, the UVs would automatically update. And then I want to assign these little brick, or I want to build these little bricks on the sides. So similar to the deleting those bottom faces, I can use some code to locate those faces and then just scatter a bunch of points randomly and then copy that little brick shape to each one of those points. And if like I was able to, if I expanded like the height of the wall, the amount of that scatter would automatically update. So it's kind of modular in that sense. And then we also have these parapets that we built on top. So we start by just taking those profiles and we locate all the t um, points on the top inside and all the points on the top outside. And then we combine them to create lines. We resample them so we can have a greater amount of parapets. Using a little bit of code, we can um, adjust the normals the way we, we want. And then we just take this little box shape and place it at each one of those points. And similar to the bricks, if you know the wall was to increase in length or something like that, the number of those parapets would automatically update. So um, obviously a little bit more went into this asset because we have like the gate and the towers, but again, I wanted just to show you um, some of the techniques we used and um, what this might look like um, in Houdini before we go in and bring it into Unity. So building these HGAs in Houdini is fun and awesome. Having these tweakable parameters is really powerful, but um, what we really want to be able to do is bring these into our game engine and manipulate these assets. And we do that through using Houdini Engine. Um, so Houdini Engine is not to get confused with the game engine itself. It's a plugin that allows you to take these Houdini digital assets that you build in Houdini, uh, take this custom user interface that you built to control um, that asset, bring that into Unity, and then manipulate it directly in there, bake it out directly in there, and then you're done. So we're kind of trying to eliminate this whole um, back and forth and baking out of your modeling package. So say we're building this level in Unity and we go into our modeling software, we model a bunch of assets, we bring them into our game engine, build our level, but they don't quite look right. So then we have to go back, uh, make some changes to those models and then bring them back into our game engine. So like I said, there's this whole back and forth that can potentially waste a lot of time. So the power of this workflow is once we build each of these assets in Houdini, we can bring them into Unity, and now the artist or the editor can just assemble those assets by um, just tweaking some parameters and then baking those assets out directly in Unity. So um, we're no longer having to, again, go back and forth, and we're no longer having to bake assets out of Houdini. We're kind of bringing in these live assets instead of static meshes. So it can be a really powerful workflow. And then this slide's just to illustrate how that interface gets transferred. So in the top, you can see I have Houdini. And in the bottom, you can see I have Unity. And I'm manipulating the exact same asset, the exact same parameters, and I'm getting the exact same results. So you can see how, um, by using Houdini Engine, I can build these assets in Houdini and then manipulate them directly in Unity. All right, so now that we have all our assets built, I'd like to show you how you would go about setting them up using Houdini Engine and then baking them out. So using the assets that we made, we're going to start by dragging in our, our little island. And you can see as I tweak some of the para uh, parameters how it's updating. And then from there, using Houdini Engine, I can draw out a curve directly on that terrain. And then once I have my curve, I can bring in my wall tool. And you can see as I go from left to right, I plug in that curve that I made into the wall tool. And then I'm going to plug in that terrain into the wall tool. And that's the information it needs to calculate itself. And then now you can see I'm going to go in and manipulate some of the parameters we built for the wall, like changing the position of the gate, turning the gate on, um, adding some towers, which also have their own unique um, controls, like controlling their height, their width. And then from there, we're going to bring in our tree system. And similar to the wall, you can see as I plug in the curve and the terrain, and then the wall or the, the trees automatically calculate themselves. So then I'm going to mess with some of the density settings, maybe have them scatter a little bit closer to our castle. And then I want to bring in my ocean asset. And this one has just a couple parameters. I can um, make it a little bit longer. I can control the amount of resolution, 
change the noise pattern. And then we have our mountain tool, which you can see I'm plugging in the ocean into that one. So it knows to start on the outsides of the ocean. And then that has a little bit more noise controls. I can control like the noise roughness, the style of noise. And then we're going to bring in one of our cloud tools, this one being um, smaller clouds. So this one kind of sits directly on top of everything, but they both function in the same way. But this one has controls for like the density of the scatter, the seed of the scatter, uh, the depth that you want them to be in relation to each other. And then lastly, we have this larger cloud, uh, cloud tool, which we are able to control the amount of large poofy shapes. And then we can control the amount of small poofy shapes. And then if any of those are intersecting, it'll do similar to what I talked about earlier, directly in the tool, converting all that to voxels and back to polygons. So we're just left with our clouds. And then now that I have my level laid out to my liking, you can see I'm going through and just selecting each asset and then hitting this button that says bake on the right. And now what it's doing is it's just um, saving a static version of each one of these meshes in my asset directory in a baked assets folder. So the cool thing about this is once I'm ready to build my final level, I can go into that folder and then drag in all my static assets into um, either this level or a different level. Um, and the cool thing about that is these assets that we just set up, um, all because I hit baked, they aren't static. These ones are still live, so I can go in and tweak them further or if, you know, I didn't mean to hit bake or, you know, someone comes back and says, oh, we actually want it to look more like this. I can just open up this, this scene that has them still live and go in and make more changes. So it's really powerful, um, especially for world building. And then this slide is to show you a little bit more about that and hopefully kind of bring home this whole point of how powerful Houdini Engine can be. So these are three separate scenes that we made using the same assets that we built for our project. And hopefully this illustrates to you how uh, even with the seven very simple assets that we made, you can get three completely different looking environments. And this took me about 35 minutes to set up all three of these scenes once I had all my um, assets built. And all I did was, in, similar to that last video, I dragged each asset in, manipulated those parameters, um, added a few base colors and a couple directional lights, and boom, I have three uh, unique looking levels. All right, so now, we talked about the um, Houdini engine side of things, so now let's talk a little bit about the characters which we made in Houdini using um, the more traditional sense. So again, these were all modeled, UV'd, rigged, and animated all in Houdini, and then exported um, out as FBX and then brought into um, Unity from there. So the characters again that we made were this knight and ranger, which are kind of your hero characters, and then the enemies being the small pirate and the larger pirate named the brute. So modeling these characters in Houdini um, I don't have, I didn't start traditional modeling in Houdini until about 15.5, so I don't quite know what it was like before then, but I can say, um, modeling in 15.5 and then with the upgrades even in 16, that, uh, traditional modeling in Houdini is really standard to any other package, especially that I've used. But the one unique thing that I found about Houdini is the fact that it has this, because it has this node-based workflow, you can kind of visualize your model or organize your model uh, in a unique way because you have access to every point in that model's um, history. So you can see in this first example I have like all the body history edits in one folder, all the head history edits in one folder. So it's just like this quirky little way of visualizing um, everything that went into um, building my model. And if I wanted I could just go into any one of those um, folders and change any of the history that I made because it's all there. And then going off of that Say I'm making a bunch of edits and I don't quite like the direction my model is going, I can just kind of you know, group all those nodes up together, push them aside, go up to an earlier spot in my history, branch off, and try again. And now just really quickly I can switch between each one of those um, variations of my model and pick the one that looks, that looks the best. So again, it's this kind of quirky thing that you really only get through modeling in Houdini because you have access to every point of that model's history. And then UVing in Houdini I found to be really, really easy and really, really straightforward. So I'll walk you through this slide to show you exactly what I mean. So I started by just taking one of the character's heads and then I broke it up into a couple different um, pieces just to help me visualize where I want my seams to be. And you can do this using either a delete node or a blast node. And then from there, all I have to do is in my viewport, select the edges that I want my seams to be. So you have to have a little bit of prior planning because you kind of got to visualize how it's going to unwrap before it does. But um, once you have that figured out, again, you just go in, select all those seams, and those get stored into a group node or multiple group nodes. And then the magic happens in this node called UV Flatten. So all I do is plug those seam groups into this node, 
and then Houdini knows to cut my model up along those edges and flatten it to the UV plane. And then from there, I'm just going to merge everything back together. And then especially if I'm working in um, multiple pieces, I can use this node called UV layout to just take all my UV shells and shrink them back to that one by one UV tile. And the cool thing too about this node is there's a little checkbox in there that basically allows you to scale each shell um, based on their size and relationship to each other. So um, like the head of this character is bigger than the visor, so the head will take up more space on the UV plane than the visor. Um, and I can do that just by hitting a checkbox. So again, UVing in Houdini was really, really straightforward. And then the last part that we did for these characters was we rigged and animated them in Houdini. Um, we pretty much started by just taking uh, one of the characters, and since all of them except for the brute were made uh, to the exact same scale, we were able to just create this base rig, convert that to, or export that as a Houdini digital asset, and then from every character after that, we could just import that base rig and then add bones on top of that for each one of their unique shapes. So like this knight has this um, big poofy shape on its helmet. So we're able to just to um, make its own unique rig by adding a couple bones on top of that base rig that we made. And then all the other tools are really standard. You know, we have our um, capture weights, we can paint weights directly in the viewport. Um, and then we also have all our animation tools, which again, similar to modeling, I found to be really, really standard to any other package that I've used. And then once we have, you know, all our animations done and our rigs done, we're able to just export each one of those as um, FBX. And then we brought those into Unity with no problem. And I even worked on a cinematic project a couple months ago where we made this gladiator character and we were able to, using this exact same method, bring uh, both the rig and animation into Unreal. And again, we had no problem. So this workflow uh, works really, really well. And then the last slide I have for you is just to show you some of the game effects that we made for um, the game that we have working at the moment. Two of them are these uh, simulations that we did. Um, the first one being this explosion effect, which was pretty much just like this explosion simulation that we did in Houdini. We applied a tune shader to that. And then in Houdini's compositing editor or compositing operator, we were able to then convert that to a sprite sheet, export it out, and then bring that into Unity, and then create our game effect using that sprite sheet. Uh, for this little ghost effect, that one was built in a couple other, in a, a few more layers. So we pretty much started by just taking each character, converting that character to a volume, and then we applied varying layers of noise displacements to, you know, make the the character like wavy like a ghost, make the edges more wispy. And then again, in that compositing operator of Houdini, we can um, uh, merge all these layers back together, export that out as a sprite sheet, and then build our little ghost effect in Unity. And then lastly, we have this uh, little glass breaking kind of um, RBD sim that we did in Houdini, and we were able to export that and import that um, import that sim's vertex animations due to some new script stuff that uh, Luis Cruel has been working on. So um, these are the effects that we have working in the game at the moment. But other than that, that's all I have for you, so thank you.